Um, it's, good to, it's good to be with you this morning. It's good to be uh, in this position. Uh, I haven't been in the pulpit, uh, so to say, in a few weeks uh, because I've got the privilege to sit where you guys are currently sitting at the moment and listen to some incredible preaching. Um, these last few weeks have been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, again, Rooted has some amazing preachers, and we praise God for that. And so thank you for your faithfulness, um, those folks that were up here, um, your boldness to preach the word, um, and, uh, and we received it. Amen and amen and amen. Uh, we continue in the, uh, the book of Psalms. Uh, if you're a guest here or haven't been here in a while, uh, we're in uh, the Psalms. We're in a series called Mixtape. We've selected a few of the Psalms. We're not doing all of them, and we've just unpacked them literally verse by verse, uh, seeking to understand what they mean uh, as they point to uh, our God who is seated on His throne, fully in control, and, and what these, those implications are for us. Uh, what does it mean to surrender our lives to God through Jesus by the power of the Spirit? Uh, and so this morning, we're going to be in Psalm 24. And so if you have a Bible, uh, you can meet me in Psalm 24. Uh, this psalm written by David uh, was, was written most probably uh, after he ha- had uh, gotten the Ark of the Covenant that had been stolen um, and returned it back to the city. Now, uh, some of you are going, what on earth is the Ark of the Covenant? And some of you are going, I, what, it was stolen? Yes, it was. Um, it was. And so uh, most people believe, most theologians believe, and I'm uh, in, in that category, that uh, David penned this uh, psalm after returning the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you might go, oh, there we go. You might go, well, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, there, there it is. That's not the exact Ark of the Covenant. No one really knows where it is right now, though uh, Ethiopia believes that they have it. But that's a, a, another conversation for a completely different day. Um, maybe Pastor Z will come and explain that when he uh, comes back to preach here. But, but uh, from the description that we are given in the, the Word of God, uh, that's the Ark of the Covenant, right? Uh, Moses was uh, given instructions by God uh, to build this Ark, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. You can read about this in Exodus 24, and if you continue to read the chapters, more description is given there. Um, but this is what it, it looked like. It was a, a golden box that was to be made of gold, right? A golden box. Um, and inside this golden box was uh, the Ten Commandments, the tablets uh, that God had uh, given to Moses uh, with the Ten Commandments. And so the very Word uh, of God was in there. The law of God was in this ark. Um, and then on top, you kind of see there's a... Uh, the, you can't really see it from probably where you're sitting, but, uh, but the top part of this little box had like another little layer to it, and that was called the mercy seat. All right, it was called the mercy seat. Now, um, if you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 5... Uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about the, the mercy seat there, um, and he uses a particular word. Uh, and that word is the word that we get, propitiation. All right, propitiation. Now, if you've been at Rooted for a while and you were here when we did the series, We Are All Theologians, you would remember that we spoke about propitiation. We should know what propitiation means. Now, you might go, oh, no, those are big words. Well, so is macchiato and uh, vente, whatever, and all those things that you guys know. So if you know those, you can know propitiation. Um, We said that propitiation means a a payment that satisfies, all right, a payment that satisfied. And it's the blood of Jesus that satisfies the the, the wrath of God that we all deserve because of our sin, all right? And and so right out the gates, God says to Moses, I want you to to have on there the mercy seat so that when the high priest goes in there and sprinkles the blood on it, it's a picture of what Jesus will ultimately do one day. See, for them, they had to do it year after year after year to satisfy the, the wrath. And it didn't even really fully satisfy the wrath of God. But Jesus on the cross, his blood was sufficient, one sacrifice for all. Okay, but, but here they had to have the mercy seat. And then on top of the mercy seat, you see those cherubims. Those are angel-like beings. Um, and they're kind of in a position of worship. It's beautiful. Again, from where you're sitting, you can't quite see it. But around the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there are these little kind of crowns. And again, to communicate a throne, right? That there's a throne on top of this, on, on the mercy seat. And then there were rings On either side of the boxes, golden rings in which uh, these poles would go through it, these poles made of acacia, right? But they had this kind of golden overlay on top of them. It was absolutely stunning, the Ark of the Covenant. And I could talk a lot about 
the Ark of the Covenant. We could unpack all the little small things, but we don't have time. So I'm not going to do that. But here's what I'll tell you, is that the Ark of the Covenant was to communicate many things, but one of the most important ones was the presence of God. It was the presence of of God. And so, and so God says to Moses, I want you to build this thing. And then this, this ark, the ark of the covenant will go in the tabernacle, which later becomes a temple, but go into the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, it must go into this place called the holies of holies. And only the high priest could go into the holies of holies. And he had to do all these things for him to go in there, because if he didn't do them, then he would die. And he would go in there and he'd sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant and all of this to communicate that, that we are in desperate need of you, God, to save us because of our sin. That's the Ark of the Covenant. And so this was stolen. Now you go, when, when, when did this happen? How, how could the Israelites allow that to happen? If we go to 1 Samuel chapter 3 and 4, that kind of tells us the story of how this got stolen. Now, if you're familiar with that portion of Scripture, you would know that that, uh, that tells us uh, the story of Samuel being called by God. But there's so much that's happening around there as well. We're told that in those times, the Word of God was rare. Now, why, why was it rare? Well, okay, let me give some context. Gosh, we're going to have to move really, really quickly. So you guys need to listen quickly. Okay. So, so, so why was it rare at that point? Well, uh, the, the sons of Eli, who were priests, ha had completely, like, disrespected, dishonored God. They were sleeping with the, 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 the temple servants, and they were eating the, the meat that was meant to be sacrificed to God. They were doing whatever they wanted. There was no fear of God. And so God goes, hey, listen, Remember, the, the priests, the priests are, are kind of the, they, they stand in between the, the, the people and God. They're, they're, in, they're in the middle kind of people. They represent God to the people and they represent the people to God. And so the priests matter. And so if the priests are doing whatever they want to do, what do you think the people are doing? Peter tells us in the New Testament he talks about us being the, 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 the priesthood of all believers, that, that, that because of what Jesus has done now, now we kind of serve and operate in that space. The church does. And so if the church is doing whatever it wants to do, what do you think the world's doing? And so the, the sons of Eli were doing whatever they wanted, and God goes, I'm not going to let this continue. And so I'm going to bring a, a curse. I'm going I'm 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 to deal with this. And so the, the word of God was rare. Right out the gates, if you read 1 Samuel 3, it tells us that the word of God had become rare and prophecies weren't as common. Any reformed people in the house, just raise your hand. It's okay, you're allowed to, you know. Because even reformed people are like, you know, I'm reformed. I, I don't raise my hand. I raise, it in, I raise it in my heart. It's totally fine. I'm reformed as well. Okay, okay. Also charismatic, but we'll get into that in a moment. So, so it's, it's, it's really interesting that, that, you know, we're in the Olympics and if you saw the opening... Man, you'd, you'd, you'd be like, what on earth is going on? The opening ceremony, like, what on earth is going on? If, if you are a reformed person, then you would know John Calvin. You know, you love John Calvin. John Calvin. No, okay, cool. John Calvin's legit. Sorry, he's legit. He's amazing. I love John Calvin. He's the organizer of the Reformation. He was French. Where is France today? See, when, when we disregard God, when we say to God, we'll do whatever we want, you are not in control of our lives. The word of God becomes rare. You go to places, I mean, we read about those places in the New Testament. You go there today, I'm telling you, it's like 1% Christian if. What happened? Well, we just said, well, God, you go over there and you do your thing and we'll do whatever because we're in control of our own lives. So the word becomes rare. That's number one. When we disregard... God, God, the word becomes rare. The prophecies aren't common anymore. Number two, the, the light, the light of God becomes dim. It later goes out completely. Why is the light important? Well, the, the light shines into the darkness. And so where there is no light, then it's dark. And where there is darkness, evil prevails. That's what's happening at this time. And then the third thing, 
is the presence of God leaves. The Ark of the Covenant is stolen in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And King Saul, he was the king at the time. I mean, he's lost the plot already. So he just goes, whatever. Kind of just continues. And so when David becomes king, now let's jump all the way to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Chapter 4 four or 5 is when he becomes king. But chapter 6, he, he kind of steps on the throne now. This is about 14, 15 years since Samuel anointed him. So it's been a while. But now he's on the throne. He's now king. He goes, you know what? One of the first things I want to do is I want to go get the Ark of the Covenant back. And so he, he goes with a bunch of men and they go and they fight the Philistines and they eventually get the Ark and it's great and it's amazing. And so here's what they do. They put it on a cart. Let's not judge David too much. though we do. Maybe it's because the word had become so rare he'd forgotten how we're supposed to handle the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe. So anyway, they put it on a cart with some oxen in front, and they're like, let's go back to the city. And they are celebrating. I mean, it is a worship time like you cannot believe. It's incre- All the instruments are out. People are singing. This is incredible. And then there's this guy at the back of the cart called Uzzah, right? And he, he kind of notices that, hey, we're on a, a rocky path here, and, 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 and the, the ark is moving back and forth, back and forth. And now it's like this thing is going to fall to the ground. And so you know what he does? He goes, I don't want that to happen. This is the Ark of the Covenant. And so he reaches out, holds the Ark, dies. God kills him. And we're told in scriptures because there, there was no reverence. God was like, you, there's no reverence. How could you just simply touch the Ark of the Covenant? And so David goes, what? What on earth? David gets upset, Right? I might as well. I'm like, Uzzah was one of the good guys. God, what's going on? He had good intentions. Guys, you can have good intentions at your place of work. You can have good intentions in your uh, circle of friends. You can have good intentions in society. But, but, but good intentions, even when you're doing the wrong thing in the presence of God, is wrong. And that's what happened in that moment. God goes, but that's not what I said. That's not how I said you should handle the Ark of the Covenant. That's not how you carry it. And so David goes, you know, I'm so upset. I'm just going to leave it here. Okay, David. And he leaves it by uh, this place, uh, the, the owner of this place. His name is uh, Obed Edom. Great name. If you're looking for a name for your child, it's a great name. Obed Edom. Right? He leaves it there and he goes back to this. He's frustrated. Uh, uh, for three months, he leaves it there. Uh, and then, but in those three months, he gets word that, hey, everything Obed-Edom does is flourishing. And not just him, but his family. Like, like they're just flourishing. There is blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And, and then David goes, maybe he went back to the word. I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. But, but he's going, it's the Ark of the Covenant. And he goes, you know what, guys? We need to go get that thing. So he goes, poor Obed-Edom. But anyway, he'd been blessed for three months, so it's good enough. So... He goes, and, 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 and David goes, and, and they get the ark. And this time, they're carrying it properly, right? They're, they're holding the poles. And, but, but the Bible tells us that on his way back, I mean, they are celebrating. They are worshiping. But on his way back, they take six steps, and then they go, now it's time to sacrifice and worship some more. And so they sacrifice a, an, an oxen, and then they sap, sacrifice a fattened calf, Every six steps. Now, there's a lot of debate, right? There's a lot of debate. I know there's a lot of debate about whether that was just the initial first six steps, and then they sacrificed the oxen and the fattened calf, and then they were like, okay, cool, we're done, and then they just made their way back to the city. Okay, uh, I don't land there. I believe that they took six steps, sacrificed. Six steps, sacrificed. Six steps, sacrificed. Now, now think, think about this for a moment. Historians tell us that from Obed Edom's house to the city is about 12 to 15 kilometers. That's about 30,000 steps, give or take, depending on how tall you are. Okay, 30,000 steps. So that's what, like 5,000 sacrificing moments. 
times it by two because it's an oxen and a fattened calf. That's 10,000 animals that were sacrificed. Again, you might be sitting here going, this seems, oh, it seems a little bit much. I think I'm with the first group. <laughs> a little bit too much there. But, but let me go ahead and tell you, I, I don't think it's too much. I actually, I don't even think that it's that uncommon. We're told that King Solomon, in, in one event, it took seven days for them to do this, but in one event, in dedicating the temple to God, he, he sacrificed 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. It took seven days to do it. But he's like, if we're going to dedicate the temple to God, then here, here's our sacrifice, God. So I, I don't think that it's that uncommon. But again, you might be sitting going, but oh, you know, it's, it's inconvenient. <laughs> yeah. W- worshiping God's going to get in the way of your schedule. Maybe you're sitting and you're going, but I mean, they could have done so much more with those animals. Is that not a waste of money? Clearly, the word of God is not rare here. In this, in this area. I would say just be careful. Uh, there was a man who once said that when, when this woman had, had taken this jar of perfume and, and, and just lavishly poured it on Jesus and worship, poured it on Jesus. And Jesus goes, is that not a waste of money? You should continue to read the story and you'll see where Judas ended. See, I don't think it's, it's inconvenient. I, I don't think it's a waste. No, I... I think it's extravagant worship. It's David recognizing who God is and going, you know what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Everybody put things down. Listen, bring the ox, bring the fattened calf. I cannot believe who God is and what he has done for us. Also, can you imagine the bloody trail? that was left behind. They, I mean, blood everywhere. And, and, yet, and yet, even that is not sufficient to absorb the full wrath of God. That that alone is just a picture, a glimpse, a trailer attraction to the blood that would be shed by our Savior. While David is, is leading this procession, he's, he's, he's leading this worship time, he, he had taken off his, his, his kingly clothes, and all that was left was this linen ephod. It's like the undergarments that a, a priest, a high priest would wear. Now, you might go, well, why would David be wearing that? He, he's not a priest, is he? He's not from the line of Aaron. He's not a Levite. You're correct. He's not. However, he still is a priest king. Is there another priest king that we read about? Now, before you go to Jesus. So excited. (laughs) There's a man in Genesis called Melchizedek, who was also a priest king. But ultimately, Jesus in Hebrews is the priest king that we need. And so David's in his uh, (laughs) undergarments. Keep it PG. He's in his undergarments and he's leading this, this, this worship, this procession. And, and as they make their way into the gates, his wife sees him, Michal, who's uh, King Saul's daughter, and she's thinking to herself, oh, so undignified. <laughs> how, how could you, uh, wh- 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 you know, and she's just, she's just like, I can't believe you, David, the king, would, 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 would perform like this. Let me paraphrase real quick. We don't have time to get into it. But here is where David goes, you know what? I will never let the dignity of man get in the way of my worship to God. That's a word for someone here. Some of us are so concerned about what other people are thinking. And some of those people are dead. Like we read their books. I I wonder what they would think about. Now listen, I'm not against craziness. Paul writes in Corinthians, he's very clear. And when we worship, there should be some order. So I'm, not, I'm against craziness, but I am all for extravagant. And that's what David's doing. He is so blown away by who God is. He's going, I can't contain it. 
And so he, he has a word with his wife. <laughs> Things don't end well for her. We don't have time to get into that. I believe he then makes his way to the king's chambers. He sits at the king's table. Through the window, he can see this bloody trail. He can hear the people uh, singing and worshiping. And, and so it's in that moment he pens the psalm in reflection to all that's just happened. That's where we get Psalm 24. And so with that introduction, <laughs> no, but we still have time. I know. I'm actually, I'm excited that I, like I got that far with, that. I'm, I'm pumped. Praise Jesus. It's with that we have Psalm 24. See, this Psalm, while telling us a lot of things, it also asks us a very important question. A very, very important question. The This question is is the most important question any man or woman can can think of or ask. It asks, what what does God require of me? Maybe another way to say it is, is, if God exists and He does, and heaven is real and it is, what do I need to do to get there? That's a really important question. And so right out the gates, David, the warrior king, demands that you steer your attention, your adoration, your praise, your worship to the one and true warrior king. It's like David is going warrior king to warrior king. But, but look at the posture. It's warrior king to warrior king. The first two verses function as as the the introduction that celebrates God as the great and victorious warrior king. And anyone who disagrees invites the Lord to become their enemy. But Oni, why would you say that? So harsh. Well, let's read those verses together. It's because the, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. The the message translation puts it this way. It says, God claims every God claims earth and everything in it. God claims world and, and all who live on it. He built it on the ocean foundations, laid it out on river girders. Here's what God is doing. He's going, dibs it's mine. I watched a bunch of kids uh, yesterday uh, playing together. It was beautiful. And, uh, and they'll come to the table and they'll go, dibs on the seat, dibs on the seat, dibs on the seat. You know, they, 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 they're laying claim to where they want to sit. And they're saying, I can do that because I first saw it. God goes, no, 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 no. Not only did I first see it, I created it. So dibs, it's all mine. Th- this is what some refer to as the cosmic ownership principle. And here, some of us sit thinking we're a big deal because we own a four million rand home. No shade. Get your four million rand home. (laughs) But just remember, God goes, mine. God says that the earth is mine and everything that fills it, it's, it's mine. There is nothing in this world that God doesn't cry, mine. Why, why does he own everything? Well, I just, I just said it. It's because he made it. He made it. And, and if, if we create something, there's a sense of ownership. I, I feel like we kind of understand that. That's why many of us will go to war. We'll, we'll go to the courts. We'll, we'll seek legal counsel if we go, no, but I created this, and now somebody has stolen it. You see, friends, God did go to war over it. And he won through his son, Jesus Christ. And when that happened, he put his stamp on everything and he goes, mine. I told you, it's mine. Those ambitions, mine. Those goals, mine. And so what do we do with those things? Well, we honor. We give glory. We surrender. David declares the greatness of God as the one who created and sustained everything. 
and then encourages us to worship and have fellowship with this powerful God. So, like, for me, it blows my mind. He goes, listen, I, I need you to know who God is. And there's a part of me that goes, like, once I recognize that, I go, holy, let me just leave. I'm not worthy to be in your space. And yet David goes, no, 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 now that you understand who he is, I'm inviting you to come and fellowship with him. But this invitation is not lost on him. It's not like he is, he's unaware of who God is and who we are. And so he asks the question, verse 3, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? This is a massive question, friends. That, that, that sadly, we as the church have made too simple. We, we've become so familiar that we kind of go, it's not that big of a deal. Failing to recognize how, how massive this is. Who? Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? It's as if David's looking around and he's just like, what? clearly not you. But then he looks in the mirror and he's like, well, not me. Who, who, who may stand in his holy place? Friends, no one should ever treat, no one, no one, no one should ever treat such a great almighty God irreverently and disrespectfully. Well, everybody was talking about the opening ceremony of the Olympics and the closing ceremony is tonight so I'm going to sit in great anticipation and I, I was kind of between two places on the one end I was like but this is what sinful people do you know like this is what left to myself me I'd also be in that opening ceremony but at the same time I'm going but I know God is holy I know that he is seated on his throne and he cannot be and should not be disrespected. We should fear him. But my, like I'm, as a church, I just feel like we've, we've normalized all of this, that, that's become all too common. But David is telling us, he's telling us that, that God is not your homeboy. God is not your friendly neighborhood pet. God is not your put in a nice theological box and tie with a bow. He is not a puppet that we string along to the sound of our theo theatrical music. He is not your personal ATM. He is no one's, hear me, he is no one's part-time lover. And, and we do that, right? Because the, the first ones I listed, many of us will go, amen. Yes. Preach it on it's so good, so good. Preach it. <laughs> but the part-time level one is like, oh, okay, wait, what? Because, because we'll go, no, 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 I, I have God and I also have ABC. And, and because some of y'all are leaders, you'll never vocally say it, but your heart is screaming it. God, I definitely want you, but I also need this bank account. God, God, I will surrender everything but my relationships. God, you can have it all, just not my dreams. God owes you nothing. He owes you nothing. And yet in Jesus Christ, he gives you everything. Th that is who David is putting before us. He's going, God, this is the God who goes, if, if he wanted to, and he would be justified in doing it, he could end all of our lives right now. And yet, he spares us by crushing his son. Friends, this is why all of heaven cries out, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. 
This is why our lives should cry, holy, holy, holy. Because we just, we just, like, it blows our minds. And yet for many of us, it's become too common. So let's go back to this question. Who? Who can approach such a holy and mighty God? D David says, let me tell you. Verse 4. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Uh-oh. Who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. The New Living Translation says it this way. He says, only those whose hands and hearts are pure. How are your hands doing? When you woke up this, this morning, what was the first thing you grabbed? How are your hearts doing? Who do not worship idols. There, there is nothing more false than an idol. Especially the one that we have crafted with our own hands. So it goes back to the first one. How are your hands doing? And we've crafted it with our own hands because it's what our hearts want. How's your heart doing? I'm telling you, all of us, we're scoring zero here. It's like, some of you are hopeful. You're like, no, me, I can get 1%. <laughs> Just 1%. If that's you, then hear this one. And never tell lies. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter what adjective you put in front of lie, it's a lie. Okay, but he was well-meaning, good intentions. So Psalm 15 can serve us as a commentary on this verse, on verse 4 of Psalm 24. Here's what Psalm 15 says. Let me read the whole thing. It says, who may worship you in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right. Mm. Speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Yo. Those who refuse to gossip. You know what gossip is? They're, they're like, in our, in our day today, go gossip is also called social media. Mm. Hashtag. Just because you put a hashtag on it. It's not gossip, it's the truth. No, it's not. Or who harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts. Those who lend money without charging interest. So, so, so if you work in a bank, you don't, you don't do. you're not doing well here, guys. It's, it's, no. Now listen, if you work in a bank, it's great. It's context. Like we, we don't have time. And who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. So let me go ahead and tell you, no one. No one. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, and who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord. This, this tells us that, that the moral behavior on, of men and women matters to God. The, the, listen, the, the theology that promotes this idea that God saves you and then you are free to do whatever you want to do because you are free in Christ is, is not only false, hear me, it's evil. It's evil. You don't surrender your life to Jesus and then go, you know what, I'm not free to do whatever I want. You surrender your life to Jesus for salvation and then you continue to surrender your life to Jesus for sanctification. The life of a Christian is a life of continually surrendering. The Bible tells us that God blesses those who live their lives in honor to him. That's why David writes it. Because he gets it. And he will receive, if we continue to read, he will receive righteousness from the God of his salvation. D David says, David says, for those who have pure hands and pure hearts and don't worship idols and don't lie. He, he says that they will be declared right before God. This is a big deal. You see, a, a speck of wrong cannot stand before a holy God. 
a speck, just a speck, just a little bit, cannot stand before a holy God. I mean, Moses, Moses asked to see God. He asked to see the glory of God. And here's God's response. He says, no human can see me and live. And so, and so he gives a, what many call a compromise, I call grace. Here's what God says. He says, okay, look, you, you can't see me and live, but here's what I'll do. Exodus 33, verse 21 to 23. says, the Lord said, here is a place near me. You are to stand on the rock, and when my glory passes by, I will put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. Now, now some people have misunderstood this because they're like, but you've got to see the back of God. No, hold on. The word back here does not refer to anatomy, but rather to what was behind God. It's like a car that moves so quickly that all that you see is the smoke. You miss the car, but you know it was there because you saw the smoke. That's what's happening here. To be more accurate, Moses saw the after effects of the radiant glory that had just passed by. That's what he saw. And, and this was Moses. Like, like, if you're thinking about Old Testament heroes, you're going, yo, Moses is a big deal. And even he couldn't see God. Like, he could only see the after effects of the glory of God. And so if we're going, that's what Moses got, what do you think you're going to get? Because of God's favor and grace, Moses got to see the smoke. You and I, because of the blazing furnace of his glory, we will become the smoke. That's what you and I get. We'll just burn up in the glory of God. Because remember, not even a speck of sin can stand before a holy God. Verse 6, such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Inquire and seek. These are, these are more, more far-reaching words, commonly used in the Psalms. They, they are far-reaching because, because we cannot reach God. Inquire, seek. Let's see how far you get on your own. Our sin makes God unattainable. It's, it's like trying to grab the wind. Anyone ever tried it? I hope not. It'd be funny to watch, but that's what it's like. It's like we're, try, we're trying to grab the wind, and you come up empty. So who, who can stand before a holy God? What, what do we do because of this, because of our sin? Two of my favorite words in the Bible, but God. These are shouting words, friends. But God. But God made him, this is Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But God, God initiates a rescue plan that is found in Jesus. Why, why, why Jesus? Why, why did it have to be Jesus? Well, because he is the only one who has clean hands and a pure heart. It's all in the text. Because he's the only one who has not appealed to what is false. I hope you're hearing my voice and seeing my fingers. Because he's the only one who has not sworn deceitfully. Because he's, he's the blessed one. The one and only true son of God. Because he is righteous. Because he not only brings salvation, but he is salvation. I got six fingers here. Just maybe, just maybe. David's going, my six steps are every time I read that and I go, oh my goodness, that's one step. That's another step. That's another step. And he gets to six and he just goes, I, I can't contain this. But I love this last bit here. He, he not only brings salvation, but he is salvation. 
I want you here to think of the name Yeshua. This, this word is a, is a combination of, of Yah, an abbreviation of Yahweh, the, the name that God gives to Moses in Exodus 3.14, and also the, the verb Yesha, which means to rescue, to deliver, to save. And so God saves, Yeshua. And, and if you look here in this chapter, if you look at this verse, the word salvation is the word. He not only brings salvation, but he is salvation. Jesus is the only one who can ascend the mountain of the Lord and stand in his holy place. He climbed the hill of Calvary. And and not only did he sit in the holy place, but he stood and took the full wrath of God on our behalf. Arms stretched wide for the salvation of all people. Why? Why? so that we might have a relationship with God, so that we might obtain eternal life, so that we might experience the promises of God. Friends, what is the alternative? Let let, let, let me tell you, separation from God, eternal death, condemned by God. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. Many of us are familiar with this piece of scripture. Because you might be sitting here and going, this is a hard word. This is a hard word. Who? Who can stand? Like, Like the bar is so high, and I would say you're correct. The bar is high. Because you and I are not the standard. God demands perfection. He he demands perfection. You and I cannot give it. And so someone else must step in our place. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 2. Just to make it clear, because I, I feel like maybe some people were missing it, which happens still today. Like, we'll be like, oh, no, but I'm not that bad. You know, this is a great message for my neighbor. I wish I'd invited them to come. You know, this is, because they, but me, I'm not that bad. Here's what Paul says about you. As for you. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. Of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, all of us, lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest... He's leaving no room for confusion. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And then here's what a lot of us do. We stop there, right? Like praise Jesus, but then we stop there. The problem with that is that that's half the gospel. Paul continues to write. He goes, no, no, it is by grace that you've been saved. And then he says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It is not because of your doctrine. I'm not against good doctrine. I'm all for good doctrine. But if you start with because sola date, whoa, 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 whoa. It is not because of your ethnicity or your gender or your race. It is not because of your status or your wealth or your accolades. It is so frustrating today that that, that the standard, we've lowered the standard to be like, if you know these three things, if you've attended this class, if you've done these things, which I am all for, but it should start with because he. Because he. Because Jesus 
did for me what I could not do for myself. I have, I have nothing to boast in but to boast in Jesus Christ alone. And then David writes, Selah. He pauses and he goes, why don't you think about that? Don't, don't, don't rush too quickly. Because many of us, we, we move too quickly. I already know this one. Do you really? Your worship will reveal how well you know this. Is it extravagant? Is it this pouring out that goes, you know what? I'm going to give you everything. We just sang it. We won't let the rocks cry out in our place. And yet, for many of us, we've stepped back and we've allowed all these other things. We've allowed our theology, our doctrine, our positions on certain things, our, our experiences on the, the supernatural and the miracles and the like. I'm not against that stuff, but hear me. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. David leading this procession of six steps worship, six steps worship, six steps worship is now at the gates of the city and so he cries out, lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. I mean, he... He cries this out because he wants everybody who's part of that city to know, guys, guess who's coming? The King of Glory. The, the gates open, signifying the worshippers' passage into the sacred presence. You see, in, in ancient fortress cities, the, the gates were often associated with the king and his authority. However, here, the language is symbolic, giving the gates human-like qualities. The act of raising them represents not just physical movement, but it, it communicates openness, it communicates hospitality, it communicates hope. This also communicates the victory of Christ as he enters heaven itself, proving that God's requirements have been met and he is the rightful king of glory. I'm telling you, everyone who was a priest, like in heaven, when they see Jesus sitting, they go, I, man, you have, you have no idea how big of a deal this is. Because priests never sat. And yet, our Savior is sitting at the right hand of the Father because He's like, it is finished. Who is this King of glory? In Revelation 21, we're told that there is an angel assigned to each gate of the new Jerusalem. So with that reality in mind, I believe we can imagine an angel responding to the question, who is this king of glory? They go, let me, t let me tell you. Let me tell you who this king of glory is. The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. He is oh, strong and mighty and mighty in battle. H how is Christ strong and mighty in battle? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's because he defeated sin, death, and Satan. His death and resurrection have done three things to sin. Watch this. It's removed the punishment of sin. It's removed the power of sin. And one day, it will remove the presence of sin. Who is this king of glory? That's who he is. However, this is only for those who believe that what he accomplished on the cross counted for them. And so you must believe. It's not enough just to hear. It's not enough just to nod your head. It's not enough to go, the points are connecting. No, you must believe. You must surrender your life to this king of glory. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up ancient doors. Th think of, of, of this being your heart. Open up, heart. 
Rise up, heart. You've been too calm. You've been too relaxed. You've treated this as too common. Then the king of glory will come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord of armies. We told you that his warriors, all of heaven and earth, in submission to the victorious king, will be with him. And so if you are in Christ, I need you to know that you are on the winning side. That as you look down at the circumstances of your life and you go, man, it doesn't feel like I'm winning. Well, you need to tell your feelings to get into submission with the gospel. Because you are on the winning side. You know how the story ends. He is the king of glory and then he ends it by going, Selah. Think about that. Think about that. This is the king of glory you, you must meet so that you may enter into the presence of God. He is the way. There is no other. And so friends, we worship. That is our only response. It's to worship. It's to surrender. See, worship is more than just singing songs. And we're going to sing in a moment. But I need you to know that worship is more than just singing songs. Worship is utter surrender. That is our only response. Here's what Charles Spurgeon says. There should be some preparation of the heart in coming to the worship of God. Selah. And to the hearing of the gospel. He says, consider who he is. In whose name we gather. And surely we cannot rush together without thought. Like so, consider whom we profess to worship. And we shall not hurry into his presence as men run to a fire. And yet that is the posture of so many of us. It's, it's just to rush. It's to rush to get here. It's to rush to get through this. And then it's to rush to get out of here. Failing to recognize who we have come to worship. Charles Spurgeon goes on to say this in one of the books that he wrote called The Practice of Praise. He says, play the organ softly when the subject is your own praise. But when it comes to the praises of God pull out all the stops. Thunderous music is too little for his infinite deserving. That he's going, even the, the thunder, it's not enough. And friends, our biggest and most beautiful instrument is our voice. Because it flows from our heart. And it declares that he is the one who is seated on the throne, fully in control and worthy of it all. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to respond. And I know you might still be wrestling a little bit and going, I'm struggling to get there. It's fine. What you do is you just, you fix your mind. Paul says that we are to renew our mind. So fix your mind on who he is and just continue to tell yourself that over and over and over again, he is the king of glory and I am loved by him. He is the king of glory and I am loved by him. And how do I know that? Because you look to the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ. That's how you know you are loved by him. And then there's some of you who are like, yo, I get that. But maybe I've just been holding back too much. You know what? I will not let the dignity of man get in the way of my worship of God. And so you cry out to him in praise and in adoration. And let this place, let this place light up. Let God see that my people not only hear me but they believe me and they trust me and they love me and so let's stand if you're able to let's stand and close out by reading this one more time lift up your heads you gates rise up ancient doors let the king of glory will come in who is he this king of glory the lord of armies he is the king 
of glory. And so, Father God, we come now in this very moment saying, God, would you do a mighty work in us? Would you stir in our hearts a passion for your name? That, God, only you are deserving of our worship because of what you have done. You sent your son to come and live the life that we should have lived. He died the death that all of us deserve, but the story doesn't end there. Oh, praise God, the story doesn't end there. That he rose from the grave. That right now, Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father and that you are interceding for us. You are praying for us by name. That every circumstance you know, every situation you know, that nothing has taken you by surprise. That God, you are the King of glory. And so we give you praise. Let our voices be lifted because our hearts are open. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.